third panel. When you were registering today or uh, walking in, we had this uh, audio book on display. It is The Spider, Wings of the Black Death, donated to us by Radio Archives. One of you uh, lucky people out there is going to be walking home or walking back to your hotel room with this. Uh, Going to do it by badge number. I have a random uh, generated uh, badge number list here. One eight three. Anyone? What? This is like great. This this that. Uh, you, you go to random integer that generator, and you get the best random numbers ever. It's like uh, each each time it's the first badge number wins it. One eight three. That's yours, Gene Christie. All right. That's it, Ed. Honest. All right. Okay, and uh, we will have another one of them. I think it is uh, one of our guests up here, Will Murray. It's one of his Doc Savage novels. That'll be going off at around, uh, I think, about 1, 1 p.m. in the dealer's room. And we will have another one during our nighttime programming. And... Uh, uh, Will got us another one from Radio Archives that we'll probably do about midway through our our uh, marathon auction tomorrow night. Okay, we got a panel of experts up here on uh, Barsoom, Edgar Rice Burroughs' version of Mars. Ed is uh, the editor of Blood and Thunder, the leading journal about pulp fiction and uh, movies, other popular culture items. Uh, to his immediate left is Will Murray, uh, best known uh, for his Doc Savage novels and, and many, many articles about pulps, pulp fiction. And he, he has, uh, he's also an expert on Otis Albert Klein's Mars. Far left is Steve Hafner, uh, who is uh, the publisher of Hafner Press does some of the best pulp reprints around. He is uh, our late Lee Brackett expert. Over here, <coughs> right next to me, to uh, my left, Garen Roberts. Uh, he's going to be talking about Ray Bradbury's Mars. Garen uh, has been working on uh, a biography of Bradbury, correct? And he was also Ray's friend for about 30 years. And this gentleman is the editor of the Burroughs Bulletin and the treasurer, treasurer, right? Treasurer of the Burroughs Bibliophiles. Uh, he is uh, our Burroughs expert, Henry Franke. All right, gentlemen. Mike did half my job for me. I, you, you want to do the questions too? I can. Yeah. Uh, questions, anyone? I think we'll start by uh, discussing the visions of Mars in the pulp magazines on a chronological basis. We, uh, this is a very fertile ground for fans of science fiction and especially for pulp. And obviously we're here celebrating the centennial of Edgar Rice Burroughs and the first appearance 100 years ago of Under the Moons of Mars, which of course we know better as a princess of Mars and which was recently filmed as John Carter of Mars. So I'm going to throw it open first to Henry, set the stage for us. Let's talk a little bit about Edgar Rice Burroughs, how he came up with the idea for Mars, and what were his influences? What did he draw on in creating his own vision of Mars? Did he make it up from scratch? Did he have other influences? And if so, what were they? I mean, let me just go real quick so I can answer. Okay. Uh, if, uh, some of y'all may have seen Irvin Borges' biography of Edgar Rice Burroughs, and of course what everybody knows about Burroughs is Tarzan. But if it wasn't a John Carter, there would never been a Tarzan. Because, in fact, it was his desire to make money and believing he could write as well as anyone. So he'd written in the pulse that he had read himself. That uh, made him uh, take the gamble. And he sent half a manuscript to uh, Metcalf, the editor of All Story. And, uh, Metcalf liked it enough that he encouraged him to finish it up and gave him some pretty significant guidance on getting that book started. But uh, what would you say caused uh, Burroughs to think of Mars? Uh, I think in many ways it's much like Tarzan. Uh, I don't think that Burroughs could remember by the time his life was over what actually led to the uh, 
the, the details and the ideas. Uh, he had, in fact, told stories to his children uh, ever since they were very young. They had phenomenal imagination. And uh, long, long before he put pen to paper or something like this, he had, to, he had had these kinds of visions of, of very imaginative landscapes and all. But if, in terms of the actual planet itself, uh, I can tell you, as you heard first below, and the ideas of the canals and Mars, and Mars actually being a center of life uh, was all the rage at those times. And in fact, uh, technically, you know, reputable people believe these were truly scientific insights about what the planet was like and what it could be like based on their understandings. And, and he took them seriously enough to be used for fiction. But he certainly took a, a great step further with his creation of a unique race of uh, you know, humanoid and uh, another unique race that were very non-humanoid, humanoid to Green Martians, which some people today still think are the origin of Green really Men. Uh, he, in fact, took this story in, in dimensions I think that very few people thought about. Burroughs, in, in the space of 12 months, created, didn't create two genres, but he, in fact, got them uh, to a point where, where readers were very excited about it and writers would start copying them. Of course, one was the interplanetary lamps, and the other was uh, the feral man. And, and those stuck around for about 30 or 40 years. And, in fact, he himself wrote two of those, both those series all the way until close to the end of his life. And the Mars, uh, I think Mars was his last book ever published, the Mars book in hardcover. Uh, it's very important. This is an interplanetary romance. Uh, Tarzan was a romance of the, of the jungle. Romantic novels had a different meaning in those days, but he was, in fact, a romance writer. And uh, these novels were about a man and a woman, you know, discovering each other and realizing eventually that they were in love. And every Burroughs novel, in fact, after that, were, were love stories. And uh, I think people don't realize that uh, he beat Father Carpenter about a few months. <laughs> and I'm always surprised that these novels aren't, in fact, being published. Uh, under romance lines. Uh, I think that you're going to see a new Tars novel that's going to actually be quite that idea from the James' point of view. But in this case, he had a romantic view of Mars itself. He took the idea of, of a, a dying planet, the idea that civilizations had risen and fallen, that there were remnants of both peoples and technologies that uh, were mixed in, uh, the idea that life was, was hard and uh, war was common and fighting for resources was way of life, and yet they still remembered their honor, they still had a code, and it's what caused them to fight the way they did and to engage each other. And uh, my president is exactly right. You really ought to read the first three books as a long novel. Because you take a man that arrives on the planet completely naked, uh, not, can't speak the language, doesn't even you know, control his own muscles, different gravity, and in two and three novels he winds up now discovering lost races, overthrows a religion, but it becomes a world order to Mars, and for a brief period, actually creates some level of, of peace on the planet. And, and of course, it then tears that peace up in subsequent sequels. But uh, what, what grabbed the people's imaginations was this vision that he had that he was able to express. Uh, Mike Resnick is also right. Uh, Edgar Burroughs learned how to write a novel in the middle of writing this novel, and you can tell that he was picking up the steam and he figured out what he was doing wrong toward the end, the part of the Metcalf. So uh, it's, it's such a great experience to, to see a vision that, in fact, was a, a guy discovering life and learning uh, to write. He even created uh, hooks in these novels that he never followed up on in any of any of the novels. Probably realized he probably made mistakes creating, but he never planned to write a sequel. And yet the first thing he did was create a cliffhanger. Mm -hmm. uh, Metcalf actually suggested killing off the Thoris, the princess of Mars, just for a little excitement. And I think Laurel by the end figured that probably not a good idea. And, uh, Romance novels continue. But I, I believe that uh, Burroughs probably equated himself more with John Carter than any other hero he created. You know, the nobility about the man and, and about the fact that he was a, a, a human uh, who had a code of honor and came into a society as marshal as it was with the, his own code of honor. And I think that's one reason why the character quit initially assimilated the culture. But his ability to actually talk about the Green Martians and the like, their alien perspective, I think, was kind of unique to the time. Uh, there's much more I could say, but I'll probably stop if some other folks a chance to talk. Yeah, we'll get another round in. I, um, I think it's safe to say that while Burroughs may not have been the only pulp writer who wrote stories of Mars in the teens and 20s, it certainly was more or less his property. Um, somebody came along that challenged his dominance in terms of writing stories about the red planet, 
and that was Otis Adelbert Klein. And here to my left, Will Murray is going to explain to us how Klein came to write and how his uh, vision of Mars differed, if at all, from Burroughs. Well, Klein was a, a writer and an and agent, a literary agent, um, who came along into the picture in the early Depression. So that's 20 years after Burroughs had started his Mars stories, and 20 years of Mars and Tarzan stories had gone from pulp magazines to hardcovers. So clearly there was a, a, a appetite for these kind of romances, in this case interplanetary romances, and no one had quite... Um, mind it the way Burroughs had for those first 20 years, a story here or there. Klein came in at an interesting time. During the Depression, all the pulp magazines were hurting, and uh, Argosy and Blue Book had been vying for Burroughs' works for several years at that point. Blue Book basically won at that point. They were able to pay uh, what Burroughs cannily uh, arranged uh, for um, his market price to be, I guess you could say that, because he played them off each other. So, you know, obviously the people at Munzee who published Argosy, you know, felt the absence of, of Burroughs very keenly, and they needed someone to uh, fill that gap. And, and a lot of people had started to do science fiction in Argosy in the late 20s and into the early 30s, so it was becoming more of a dominant thing in Argosy. And Klein was in, in a lucky spot of being able to fill a void that was otherwise unfilled, and that was to do the Martian romance. And uh, to the degree that you could say that Klein's Mars, or Klein's version of Mars is different than Burroughs, well, it's more specific to say that it's a mirror image. Because we have swordsmen, ray guns, uh, the, the typical humanoid aliens, the, the, the chivalrous aspect, an Earthman on Mars, etc., etc. Um, so we're li really looking at a pretty blatant imitation. Now, I want to say in the defense of Klein, because he's, he's much maligned, and you know, he's been much maligned ever since he came on the scenes and, and Burroughs aficionados, you know, pointed to him as doing essentially pastiches or rip-offs or whatever they would call them back then. Well, that's true to a point, uh, but what's really true is, is the Bunzi editors wanted someone to substitute for Burroughs, and they wanted a Burroughs a Barosian product, and Klein delivered. And Klein was a good writer. A lot of us here, myself included, probably first encountered Klein in the Ace editions of the 60s, and I guess maybe into the early 70s. I think they were still reprinting them then. And they're kind of choppy. Well, they're choppy for a reason. They were chopped up. They took the original pulp text and they, they chopped them down. There's Jim Van Heis, who's a, another aficionado of Klein, Clarence was telling me earlier today, there's two whole chapters missing from The Swordsman of Mars, the first uh, Klein Mars book, um, as well as some other matter. So when all of us, most of us, who didn't buy the pulps off the stands encountered Klein, we encountered them in some form of reprint that was pretty significantly chopped up. So he's, he's been maligned as a choppy or a poor writer. He's actually a good writer. In some ways, he, you could say he might be a better stylist than Burroughs, but nobody has been. He's, he's his own genre. So what we ended up in the Mars books was an Earth man transported to Mars, with ending up with a sword and, and becoming a major force for, 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 for heroics and good. And uh, so they're more similar than they are apart. The Mars books, of course, were, take place a lot in, in these isolated dying cities with dead sea bodies and stuff, so it's, it's a dying planet. The Klein Mars is a little more lively in the sense it's, it doesn't have that um, zombie kind of feeling that Clark Ashton Smith put into his zombie stories where it's all going downhill at the end of the lifespan of that planet. Um, but otherwise, it's pretty much the same Robin Hood, Zorro, Daring Do on, on Mars. Um, that's pretty much it. And of course, as Burroughs owned Mars in the teens and the 20s, and Klein came along to challenge that ownership in the 30s. In the 40s, we had another movement. Now, Henry referred to the interplanetary romance. Later on, people were, would refer to these kinds of stories as space opera. And I think the queen of the space opera really has to be Lee Brackett, who wrote, uh, I think, a lot of her finest work in, in this genre for planet stories which of course was a pulp magazine specifically created 
for this type of action story. It did not rely on hard science to the extent that Gernsback's Amazing or even Campbell's Astounding did, but uh, it was filled with this kind of, of lusty adventure, and Brackett did it surprisingly well. And nobody knows Brackett better than Steve Hafner, who has published collections of her work. So Steve, tell us, how do... Uh, how does Lee Brackett's vision of Mars compares? What did she do? What did she bring to the our pulp vision of the red planet? Uh, it's a great question. What I think Lee Brackett brought to Mars and the pulps is that it was already a lived-in environment. You had, you know, from 1912 uh, with Burroughs' story to Brackett's first story in astounding 1940 called, oddly enough, Martian Quest. Um, by that time, Mars is not this new foreign land readers, you know, you had almost four decades, or three decades, three and a half decades, to, to enjoy adventures there. Brackett brought her own world view to it, and despite Brackett being known as a, a sword and fantasy or a space fantasy writer versus a science fiction writer, the first three stories she published were all sold unagented to John Campbell, and they are very science fictional, despite being called Martian Quest or Treasure of Takuth. Um, it wasn't until she started to sell a story here, a story there, to common stories or science fiction before she found her voice in a Planet Stories magazine. And oddly enough, her Brackett's uh, reputation as a space opera writer, uh, more than half, I, I'd say, um, I'll call it 60%, of her planetary romances took place in Thrilling Wonder and Startling Stories. Um, she just did it better than anybody else writing for Planet, except maybe, you know, Ray Bradbury at his peak. So that's where she's remembered. But getting back to, you know, what did she do in her work and what, it, what changed after, you know, she was established and other people came along. And what you've got is a Mars again in decay, and this time the the environment and the inhabitants of those lands know it's in decay, and there's nothing they can do about it. So it's sort of like the you know the mining town in the old west that's been worked out. You've got brackets Martian cities with the clever names of Barrakesh. Um, you can work out where she pulled that from, and she takes characters who are down on their luck pre Han Solo space rogues. You've got uh, Hugh Stark and Lorelei the Red Mist, and of course her signature character, Eric John Stark, uh, a human, uh, abandoned a la Tarzan in the hellish heat of Venus, which burns his skin black, and then he's transplanted between adventures on Mars and Venus in three novelettes, and then later on resurrected in the 70s on a different uh, planetary system. But you know, these are people that don't look beyond the next sunrise. They're working for their next meal, the next dollar, and when they get that dollar, they might buy food or they might buy hallucinogenic drugs that cause a permanent atavism. You know, the present's so bad, the future looks so bleak, I'm just going to physiologically retard myself with this miracle drug called Shanka. And Brackett did a lot more than that, um, and I'll save that for round two. Bleak future reminds me of New Jersey, really. <laughs> On turnpike? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, Brackett, of course, after a lot of those classic stories, uh, her collaborator, if I'm not mistaken, on Lorelei of the Red Mist was one Ray Bradbury. Is that not true, Steve? I, I heard that, yeah. Yeah. Well, Bradbury made his own contributions to Martian literature, and his, I think it's fair to say, and as I think many of us know, were far different from those of... Burroughs, Klein, and even Brackett. So Garen is our resident Bradbury expert. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what became the Martian Chronicles and how it started and what great Ray Bradbury did to alter our visions of Mars. The, the stories of, of Bradbury and the Martian Chronicles are, of course, as fascinating as we've already heard so far. Um, I like what Henry said and, and, and Will and Steve and in a sense, Bradbury continues a tradition of the romance. Um, unlike contemporary authors like Kim Stanley Robinson, Ben Bulba, or Gregory Benford, who've taken a more scientific-based uh, approach to Mars. 
Bradbury, as you might know, was born in 1920. He died a couple months ago on June 5th at the age of 91. And when he was born in 1920, of course, uh, Under the Moons of Mars was already nine years old, and it was, was known by lots of people. Bradbury had an aunt. Her name was Aunt Nivia, and she, uh, he grew up in, uh, even though he's most associated with Los Angeles, he grew up in Waukegan, Illinois, which is between uh, Chicago and Milwaukee, uh, up on the line there. Uh, it's not a nice town today as it was back in his day. And uh, his aunt took him to silent film and took him to all kinds of neat things from the Lost World uh, in the 20s at the age of four. He uh, not only saw uh, some of the early productions of Hunchback in Notre Dame in the 20s, he saw um, Phantom of the Opera at the theater when they were new and all that kind of thing, and he claimed to remember that throughout his, his lifetime. Um, he was a big fan of Buck Rogers. He collected all the strips, pasted them in, in books. Same thing with Flash Gordon. And, of course, his mentor, who we often acknowledge, was Lee Brackett. He uh, was good friends with both Edmund and Ali. And um, I, I know he had a, an infatuation for her and just a respect for her that was was unbelievable. Um, the story of how he put the Martian Chronicles together, maybe some of you know this or not, is it's a fascinating story. As you know, until later in his life, Ray uh, really didn't fly. And he had trouble with public transportation. He preferred a bicycle and his feet to just about anything else. But in about 1949, he realized that he wanted to publish a book. He'd, he'd been publishing in Thrilling Wonder Stories, Planet Stories, uh, some Canadian magazines, most notably Maclean's. And he wanted to publish a book. So where do you think he went? Where's the world publishing headquarters of the world back in those days? Probably still today. Sox City. Sox City's neat. <laughs> Homa Culver's, Homa Arkham House. But no, uh, he went to New York City. So he got on a bus, went to New York City with a briefcase full of tear sheets from Thrilling Wonder Stories, Planet Stories, and other places like McLean's. And when he got there, he checked into the YMCA. Um, and he started to make the circuits uh, that week of, of the publishers in New York City because here's this nice condensed area of publishing. <laughs> and Bradbury was a, was a wonderful man, and upon his death a couple of months ago, that was the one thing I wanted people to know when they asked me about him was that, yeah, he was a great story writer, but he was a neat man. Remember that about him. He was a nice man. He lived life. He loved life. He loved people. And uh, he was a very good friend. Um, so he got there and he, he talked to the publishers in New York City and, and they said, you know, these are really cool stories and, and they're kind of neat, you know. And you've had this thing done with August Derleth back in a couple years before that, Dark Carnival, you know. George and I were talking about that earlier today. And uh, I've only got five signed copies of the original from Ray. Um, one for my kids, each of my kids, yeah. But anyway, um, the publisher said, no, you know, there's just not a market for short stories. And we kind of know that short stories are cool. We like them. There's some really neat collections. Maybe the best anthologist and editor of, of short stories. Here's some controversy. You can yell at me or argue with me. But in the 20th century, with August Derlow. That man had a talent, despite what S.T. Josie and whatever revisionist fiction you'd like to embrace. Uh, you know, he was unbelievable. But the publisher said, Ray, no, this is really cool, but what we need is a novel. Ray went back to make the story short, went back to the YMCA, and he wrote transitional pieces between the stories. And the result was the Martian Chronicles. So there's Thrilling Wonder stories, there's Planet stories, there's stories that originally appeared under titles like Mars is Heaven, which became the third expedition. There's the Carnival of Madness, which is the wonderful Martian Chronicles story, Usher 2. And, um, he, of course, he always acknowledged a love for Burroughs. He, he had read Burroughs as a kid. His aunt had really facilitated all this kind of stuff. And uh, pretty neat. So we can say a few more things about him in a little bit. But it's, it's a really neat story. He goes out on the bus and, and checks into the YMCA, and he fashions his short stories together for the New York publishers. Yeah. 1950 comes Martian, Martian Chronicles. Chronicles. Yeah. Well, now we've established a rough timeline, so let's bounce around. Garen, let's stick with you for a minute. I'm wondering um, what it was that drew Bradbury to Mars as a locale for his stories, because I think you can argue 
that unlike the, the fiction of Burroughs and Klein and Brackett and some of the other space opera writers, I think a lot of Ray's stories said things that they didn't necessarily have to be said on Mars. He, he, he was exploring other themes. Why do you think he was attracted to Mars as a venue for, for the, the stories that he was trying to tell, the ideas he was trying to convey? Well, there's about four answers to that question. Um, so I'll go off on tangents for a couple ahead. minutes, okay? Um, Ray never could figure out, there's a famous New York Times quote that said on many of his books, the greatest living science fiction writer. Well, first of all, Ray, like other famous authors of, of our day, most notably Harlan Ellison, Scott might be here today, um, Dean Koontz, uh, Clyde Barker, another friend of mine, um, they did not like genre categorizations, and Ray never has neatly fit into He's not a science fiction writer. He's written a couple things. He's had two things that appeared in Astounding in 1942 and 43, but hard science, no, that's not Ray. And Ray would say to you, you know what? Um, if you want me to explain how the guys get out of the ship and how they can breathe on the atmosphere without special apparatus and going through all the science, then you've missed the metaphor that I'm trying to get to. And um, so he would he would talk about it. So you say, this is I remember Ray saying this. He'd say, say, ah, he's a good guy. Ray's all right guy. We'll just let him get away with that and we'll go with it. So a lot of poetic license uh, went on with with Bradbury. And then so what he did was a kind of a obviously a sociological science fiction with statements about about uh, people and life and um, all those kinds of things. And so. So that was kind of neat. Now, interestingly, when the Martian Chronicles, many of you know this too, came out from uh, uh, the British publisher, uh, Rupert Hart Davis, uh, the title of the uh, book was a lot more descriptive. It was called The Silver Locusts. And based on a, one of those bridge pieces he wrote in the YMCA that, that week in New York City. Um, I'm carrying it out again. Go ahead, go ahead. It's, 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 great, it's great stuff. <laughs> Bradbury was also a master of revision, and uh, a lot of his Mars stories appeared in EC Comics. That's a wonderful story, how he went to uh, uh, Bill Gaines, and Bill Gaines had been adapting his stories in EC Comics and had never contacted Bradbury. Maybe some of you have heard the story. And Ray wrote him a real polite letter and said, geez, I really like what you're doing with my stories. When can I expect a check for him? And uh, Bill said... You know, you're right, that's an oversight on my part. And they started a relationship. He paid him for the back stories and contracted Bradbury for future ones. Bradbury, of course, had stories written for for um, radio and all kinds of things. And some of the Martian stories went as many between five and seven different revisions, depending on whether they were in a pulp, in the story, a radio script, uh, even uh, short films were made. Um, Great stuff. Archer, too. I, I, I know I'm preaching to the choir here. Carnival of Madness. What a, what a wonderful, wonderful story if you haven't read that, right? About Stendhal and, and, and recreating Poe on Mars and all that kind of thing. I think Mars, uh, to answer your question, Ed, gave him kind of some latitude. People always ask him, and I've seen this quoted many times, how in the hell did you know in Fahrenheit 453 and in, in, uh, 451 in 1953 that that was going to happen, and he said, I hope to hell it wouldn't happen. I wasn't trying to predict it, I was trying to prevent it, just like George Orwell in 1984. And uh, he said, so you try to take what you know, and then you, you kind of speculate from there. <laughs> so Mars kind of gave him that setting, that situation that allowed him to do that. Well, continuing on this theme a little bit, Henry, maybe you can tell us. Uh, Burroughs, I think it's safe to say, used the creation of Martian society and culture to reflect some of his own views and values. Can you give us a little more insight as, as to what he was? I, I'm thinking specifically about his attitudes towards religion. I mean, how does his own worldview and attitudes fit into his uh, Martian fiction? Uh, that is, in fact, uh, true that uh, Burroughs himself, despite claiming he only wrote for entertainment, in fact, always infused his philosophy his worldview in, into all of his stories, especially Tarzan. But uh, there's a very critical thing that he did with the Martian series, and that was his uh, his lack of confidence in organized religion. And uh, he attacked uh, false religions uh, not just once in that series. Uh, obviously, God of Mars and Warlord of Mars were, were 
took a vow to take him down and organize religion that had basically ruled the entire culture of this dying world for thousands and thousands of years where people actually sacrificed themselves. And it turned out that they were sacrificing themselves to false gods who had uh, ulterior motives. And he took down another religion in, in, a, in a populated series. Um, he, he, of course, came from a generation that believed that, that war itself was an honorable thing in, in all sorts of ways, and that it was an honor to if you comport yourself properly in, in, in wars. He himself tried to get in uniform several times. And the martial components of, of all of the stories, of course, come through. Is that, well, I think late in life he realized firsthand when he was in Port Pacific, but throughout the horrors of war, and it reflected in his last stories a bit more. But he was of his generation, and, he, and of course he took the idea of the Code of Honor very seriously, and it, it's infused in all of his stories, uh, including how men and women treat each other. And, and But it was interesting how you would take the, 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 the codes of, and morals of, of any culture and see how they sometimes turn to be, to be silly. And he took advantage of those in many cases in many social situations. So uh, his beliefs and even as something simple as how you take care of an animal, but he was an animal lover. When they, when they abused uh, Willa in the very first story, it's an example of how he believed in taking care of, of uh, companions that weren't human. So uh, the world's philosophy was, was, was there throughout. The idea of companionship and friendship, you know, uh, the green men actually laughed when people were tortured and died. They had different set of emotions. Like I said he looked at that race was truly as alien. But he found a way of, of choosing the idea that friendship could, in fact, make major differences in how people took care of each other, thought of each other, and how you could actually create the idea of friendship in the human race. So those ideas of, of his, I think, the, were first and foremost in the Mark novels. Steve, uh, uh, you know, when you think about the types of stories that Burroughs and Klein and some others wrote, do you think primarily of masculine writers creating a world and looking at it from a masculine viewpoint. I wonder how much was Sleep Racket influenced by these male writers and what, in your opinion, does she bring to her stories of Mars that the male writers don't, if anything? I love the way you ended on that because I don't think Lee's gender had any bearing on what she brought or what she left in the genre while she was in it and here we are 30 years after her death. Um, Howard Hawks, the film director and producer, said he hired Brackett because she wrote like a man. Which, on its surface, sitting here, is kind of a dumb thing to say, but if you put yourself in his shoes, you really understand what he's saying, is that she didn't write, you know, um, a parlor mystery. I mean, she wrote adventure stories, you know, barehanded, knuckle-dragon, bloody mouth kind of stuff. Um, you didn't ask this question, but I'll, I'll offer it out there. She also has on, gone on record as saying she never felt discriminated against because of her gender, whether she had an androgynous name or not, which this is trivia. She was born lay bracket. That's how you pronounce it. And when she started to uh, look into getting work in Hollywood with some jobs at uh, Republic Studios and... Um, there was another studio she worked for before she got picked up at Warner's for the big sleep. Was it a monogram? Columbia. Columbia, thank you. Crime doctor? Yes. Yes. And um, she knew that the name Lay wouldn't fly too well in Hollywood, so she changed it to Lee. And that's how she was known um, throughout the rest of her life. I never heard anybody say her name that way except herself in an audio recording. So... And having done that by writing so-called masculine fiction in the genre, uh, she was never put up as one of the poster children as one of those trail-breaking, genre-busting uh, feminist writers as the new wave came on. Um, and just as C.O. Moore is getting kind of re-recognized as somebody who used initials not to hide her gender, but to hide from her employer that she was using the company typewriter to write for Weird Tales. Because <laughs> if she could write fiction, then she was taking a man's job by being a secretary at a bank, in theory. Um, refresh my memory, what was Yeah, so, so I, I'm, I'm wondering from what you know of her, what, how influenced was she by these earlier visions of Mars when she approached her own stories? Thank you very much. She was obviously uh, influenced by Burroughs. Um, she has numerous occasions uh, 
blank her entire career, starting by reading Gods of Mars when she was sick in bed. Um, and then she needed to know what happened at the end of that book because of that classic cliffhanger. Uh, other writers that influenced her were Robert E. Howard. Uh, once she got established, she was reading James M. Cain and putting that hard-boiled dialogue into her work so that after she sold her first 20 stories or so, she's built a consistent universe, universe rather, um, she's got repeating characters, she's building up a library of themes, uh, very much like uh, you know a Clint Eastwood kind of loner, almost figures in all of her classic stories. And just to have thrown it out there, if she first published in 1940, she didn't see book publication until 1953 with the Sword of Rhiannon, which is a retitled Sea Kings of Mars uh, from Thrilling Wonder, 1947? June? Had a birdie cover, you know what I'm saying. Pretty close. And um, by 1955, she has written a short story called Last Days of Chandacor. And she intends to leave her planetary romances behind and her next couple stories that aren't mysteries, suspense thrillers in the Midwest. Um, they're modern <coughs> kitchen sink dramas with a science fiction flavor. Uh, run away from startling stories and a couple pieces for Venture and Magazine of Fantasy and Science Fiction. But both the readers and the editors, uh, like Ed Furman, like Samuel Mines, they wanted that old bracket magic. So about every eight or nine years, they drag in another story, whether it's in the magazine of fantasy and science fiction as Purple Priestess of the Mad Moon, or uh, The Road to Sin Herod in Amazing Stories 1963. Uh, one thing that helped Brackett with this kind of material also was the repackaging of a lot of the planet stories in an ace paperback during the Burroughs boom called The Coming of the Terrans. And like Bradbury, she sort of cobbled up these artificial dates uh, to make it a cohesive book, if no attempt at a novel form. And it had a, a Gray Morrow, Crankle esque cover, and I think that's why I remember her as the writer she was. And she certainly was a terrific writer. Will, as a novelist yourself, uh, what is your appraisal of Klein's work? You, you touched on it briefly, but give us a little more about Klein's work as a stylist, and, and specifically, do those people who dismiss him as a rank imitator of Burroughs, uh, are they doing him a disservice? Is there more there than meets the eye? Well, he was a rank imitator of Burroughs. <laughs> okay. I mean, but that's that's the slot that, you know, I, I don't know w which is the chicken and egg here, whether he was a fan of Burroughs and, and was pitching a su himself as a substitute or whether the, the Muncie editor said, well, we need some, someone to fill this void because people like these stories. Um, you could say a lot of good and bad things about Burroughs as a writer. He's extremely compelling, but he also tended to be very repetitious. And, and of course, he wrote a lot more Mars and Tarzan books than, than Klein did the equivalent, because Klein wrote Venus books before Burroughs did, and Tarzan-type characters after Tarzan. But um, as a stylist, I think he was a pretty good 1930s-era pulpter. pulpter. He, had, he had, had that... <laughs> That style that tended to be very <laughs> adjective laden, they all did that then. There was a definite 19, early 30s pulp style that smoothed out as the 30s progressed and completely cleaned out as the 40s began. He wasn't really writing much past the 30s. So I would put him on, on the B list as far as a stylist. I think he was a good writer. And I think he was, a, you know, if he was writing, if he's writing something other than an imitation, of a writer, and not just a you know imitation in terms of the character, but the whole the whole genre. I think you put it, you still put him in a B list, but you know, I don't know what his career would have done had he gone completely off on his own and didn't uh, didn't hew that line to, to be the alternate to Burroughs. I want to make a point, however, about about all these writers in Mars, uh, starting with Burroughs. It has been said, and this doesn't get, and I forget who said it, but it doesn't get brought up. In terms of us writing about Mars, no matter which writer it is, or even if it was one of us, we're always doing from the infant setting. 
point of view, the Earth man point of view. Um, so we're always bringing to Mars ourselves, because if we wrote for the real Mars, if, if they had the knowledge, you know, there are no people on Mars, and if they were at one point, we don't know if they were humanoid or not. But someone made the point that Burroughs' early days as a casual man in Arizona, the dusty, dry area, <laughs> fighting the Red Indians and Apaches, or chasing them, policing them, and the fact that at one point that desert of Arizona was a, a sea, and you can still find the seashells. I'm reminded of Lester Dent's story of, of growing up in Wyoming, which is not terribly far from Arizona from the western point of view, of going up to Devil's Tower and finding all these petrified oysters and shellfish and cracking them open and, 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 and realizing that he was living in what was once the bottom of the sea. Burroughs transported that whole desert that was once the bottom of the sea with this alien race to Mars, because that's what he knew. And that's what all these writers did. Yeah. Now, Klein was taken from Barlow's, but Klein obviously updated his character, the, the, the John Carter Confederate to a, a more modern military man. They still had swords in the, yeah. in the 1930s. Um, so everybody's bringing Earth to Mars to make it interesting for people on our planet to read it. So, you know, the, our Mars, our default Mars, is, is a is, is sort of an extraction of parts of Earth that are interesting in that way that they could plausibly do this. You know, I, 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 this point was raised earlier in the panel, and, and nobody quite addressed it. Why are we always looking at Mars? There are Venus stories, but not as many as Mars. Well, Mars is rare. It's getting out of the sky. And it's got a cooler name. Maybe that's what God is more. Whereas Venus looks just like another star. You know? And I think we like Mars. It's near us. But it's a different color, and it's a mysterious, moody, bloody color. And so we can bring we, Mars reads as drama, whereas Venus might seems a little airy, fairy, right? Bright color. And I think that's why we have so many Mars stories. You know, it's it's that that appeal of the, the blood red planet that's nearby that could, you know, we be off. Almost everybody's conception of it's a dead world, but it is a dead world. We're yeah. out there now, and there's nothing there. And uh, I think that's why we see a lot of Mars stories. And Mars being the god of war, of course, lends itself to the kind of furious action and the kind of you know, you set, conflict. You set stuff on Venus, and it's all love stories. Right. Well, with, you know, that's, the, that's our mentality, because Venus evokes that kind of concept. Right. Know? And both those writers did go to Venus, they, and they did basically tell Mars and stories on Venus, because that's the, the genre as it evolved. <laughs> So that's a long way to play. Did I answer that question? Yes, yes you did. I did. Uh, so I think we have a pretty clear picture. Now, again, we don't mean to suggest that these were the only science fictional stories written about Mars, the kind of interplanetary romance or space opera, whatever you want to call it, the stories of action. Obviously, there are other stories involving Mars, but since we're celebrating Burroughs, this is the type of story we're discussing. So with this, I'd like to throw it open for questions. Any of you have questions, I would ask that you stand up and for the benefit of the other people in the audience, please uh, state your question loudly and succinctly, and uh, you can address it to one panelist or to, to uh, all of them, and we'll get as many as we can in in the minutes that we have remaining. So who's got a question about any Martian pulps? Yes, sir. Did everybody hear that question? The question was about Edwin L. Arnold and what influence, if any, he had on Burroughs' Mars stories. Uh, as you know, I think Dick, Dick Rupoff in particular suggested that uh, you know, Arnold had a significant influence because uh, actually there are two novels that potentially could have had a fraud of Phoenician. People forget that John Carter was always 30 years old, didn't, never, didn't remember when he was born for being nothing but an adult. And then, of course, there's the, uh, the Mars novel that uh, Arnold wrote. And there's a lot of parallels. Pearls was widely read. Uh, he did live in Chicago. He did go to the public library. And, uh, and there's, in fact, you even try to track down the new book that we've seen in, uh, that was in his library one time. So, we, we, it is not, since these books were published in, in low numbers, it is a possibility. And I don't think we have much more proof than that, that we could say yes or no on that. But it, I think that the facts don't say it's not possible. Next question? 
Oh, come on, there's got to be some other questions. I'll ask one of Garen. Uh, did Ray see the Martian Chronicles as a, a unit? Were there certain stories, certain episodes of it that he favored more than others? Were there certain aspects that, that he thought particularly important? Well, that's a, that's a good question, um, Ed. Um, I mentioned the Silver Locus, the British edition. Uh, that was, that uh, was published without uh, some parts that were in the Martian Chronicles. There were Mars stories that would occur after the Martian Chronicles. Um, I believe there's one in the Illustrated Man in 1951. And um, so there were some. And then later on, there were times, as I mentioned, he was, was big into revision, which is great fun for academics because it gives them lots to do. Um, and I can say that being an academic. Um, he had some different configurations of the Martian Chronicles. He had stories that didn't quite fit in with the, the regular uh, original novel, and there have been different expanded versions done through the years. I probably didn't answer your question. But it's not the first time I've said that. It's pretty, pretty cool. uh, Yes, sir. Please stand up. What was, uh, what was Ray's opinion of Richard Matheson's version of him of the Martian Chronicles? On the TV search, TV search. Rock Hudson and all that stuff. Yeah. It was pretty bad, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, I have the, the manuscript for that screenplay that Matheson wrote. Um, I don't know that I, I really can remember or tell you exactly for sure. Of course, what's so interesting about science fiction writers is, is in, and I'm generalizing, but they evolve in kind of like geographical areas, right? And so there's the West Coast group that included uh, Matheson and Bradbury and Beaumont. And, and one of our guests a couple of years ago, Bill Nolan, was a very good friend of, of Ray's. Um, so I don't really have an answer to that. I do know that Bradbury was a great uh, a friend and fan of Rod Serling, but after Serling did the one uh, Twilight Zone of his stories, he said never again to the electric grandmother. Now, why is that? He just didn't like how uh, how Rod reinterpreted the story. It wasn't the way he wanted it. Hmm. I didn't know that. Yeah. Barry, in the back. Yes, I have a question for Garen. She brought up the Martian Chronicles. What's your favorite story in the book? Oh, boy. Why there's... is it? Why? <laughs> well, there's two I mentioned. Uh, probably Mars is Heaven, is, is a, is, which is the third Third expedition is, is really very, very good. That went through several different variations and different endings to it, which is, is kind of neat and done differently in different places. Um, I like that concept. There's a real romance using kind of Henry's and Will's and, and Steve's wording there to that story, the idea that heaven can actually be found and that you run into grandpa and grandma again. And, and that's a very powerful story for me because I, I like that. It's a very happy story, at least at the start. Usher 2 is one of the great revenge stories, mm -hmm. yeah. and uh, I, I like that one a great deal. Uh, Ray's favorite story, and it's a third one that I like a lot, when, when, when he contributed a story to one of my books, and I asked him, I said, I want you to pick your favorite story, and of course, if you were to talk to like Jack Williamson in the past or whatever, ask them a question like that, they would say, well, that's like choosing between my children, I can't do that. But I'll tell you one that and I... And then they go ahead and pick one. They go, <laughs> ahead, they go ahead and pick one. And he picked one, which today comes to life all the time when you walk in a big box store, when you see the little robot vacuums and stuff, and that's a story called There Will Come Soft Grains, which was first published in Maclean's in Canada before people really knew about it. it was in, yeah. That's fun stuff, Barry. Yeah. Got time for one more question? Yes, sir. Uh, was there... So, um, there's... The British vision of Mars, like H.G. Wells, you know, the War of the Worlds. Um, one thing we're talking about for, you know, particularly American authors. Is there anything particularly American about um, the the vision of Mars presented in, in these authors' work? Is there a particularly American vision of Mars? You want to take that one? Well, let me see. With Burroughs and Klein, it's essentially the U.S. military man. With Burroughs, it was the cavalryman because he was a cavalryman. With Klein, it was just the generational 
thing beyond that. But as far as um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and I won't go on long. But in terms of bracket, you got you know a lot of lone gunslingers uh, and mercenaries for hire. Uh, walking across that Martian landscape, uh, selling their services while you know fending off sorcerers and warlords. Yeah, these are Second Amendment Martian stories. <laughs> Second Amendment, yeah. <laughs> you know, what's interesting is, uh, you know, right on about this idea of Burroughs having done his cav cavalry time at Fort uh, uh, Fort Apache, I think it was. And uh, in fact, the question has been: Were Green Men, in fact, his interpretation of American Indians? Uh, themselves because they were nomadic and all. And in fact, it's important to understand that Burroughs respected uh, the American Indian, and he was one of the first writers in, in America that actually wrote synthetic novels about Indians, which is to uh, Apache novels. So uh, you're right, he did all sorts of American aspects of life. The, the idea of the, the individual is able to, in fact, rise above in even alien situations, and the idea of uh, of an American or Midwest culture, the, cat, the frontier being introduced back to tomorrow. Uh, we're going to wrap it up here. Uh, Barry kind of stole my thunder a little. I wanted to close. Uh, Garen has already answered for his part, but I'd like to ask my other panelists of the respective authors that they have been here to discuss, what are your favorite? If you had to pick one favorite, and let me preface this by saying, after these panels, whenever we do these panels, people come up afterwards and they say, you know, I loved when you talked about such and such a story because I want to find that story now. I want to go in the room and I've never read it and I want to do this. So for the benefit of people who may go in the dealer's room tomorrow and start looking for anthologies or pulp magazines or some of the reprint collections like Steve publishes, let's start. Henry, what is your favorite Burroughs Mars story and why? Even though you asked me a great question, let me throw in one quick thing here. Uh, okay. To honor Ray Bradbury, who was an honorary member of the Bibliophiles, and, uh, and really, truly, was never afraid to say in public how much he, he respected uh, uh, Burroughs as a creator. Uh, I've got uh, a quote here he, he, in Paris Review when he was interviewed by Sam Weller. He said, Burroughs is probably the most influential writer in the entire history of the world. Now, Ray Bradbury can be enthusiastic about things, but I, I know he believed that. And you know, when you read, what the Mars in particular did, in inspiring scientists, writers, and artists through the years. Uh, he, you know, Bradbury wrote the introduction, by the way, to, to the, uh, the Burroughs biography, where he said, that Garth Burroughs has probably changed more destinies than any writer in American history. Um, it is significant to note that, in, in, in a very odd ways, Burroughs, in fact, fired imaginations. He's still inspiring people today. There, were, there was a middle school teacher that actually did a reading project with the Prince of the Mars. And they brought many kids in uh, a few months ago and asked them to talk about the novel. And it's amazing how much they actually enjoyed it. And that's something to say about how uh, writing and storytelling is so important. And, you know, thank goodness for all the writers that are represented here. Uh, I'll throw out an interesting novel to track, track down. That's uh, A Chessman on Mars. Or it creates Mars, uh, a chess game that actually can be played. You change one rule, it's actually winnable. Uh, and it's got so much imagination, and it's just a very interesting idea and a very great, great novel. And Chess Men comes at what point in the series? It, it's the fifth in the series. Well, how about you? Do you have a favorite Mars novel by Klein? No, I think the first one, because it, it opens up his version of Mars. He didn't write very many. Right. Yeah, he didn't write very many, many of any of the series. So he was like a comet. He just he was a 1930s. Burroughs Comet. No, the first one, because it established. So that would have been in Argosy 30, uh, 31, 30, 32? Jim, 31 or 32? Is Swordsman the first? Yeah. Oh, no, but of the, the Mars, Mars, Mars books. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Swordsman of Mars. So that was originally serialized in Argosy, and that, I believe, has been reprinted, and of course it was it was printed in hardcover. I'm sure there are people in the dealer's room who will have it. Steve, how about you? Where would you advise people to start? What's your favorite uh, Bracket Mars story? I wanted to make sure I got the right date, so I pulled up the Mac here. Um, the one that gives you the best bang for your buck in terms of word count is uh, widely available. Uh, it was in print for you know 30 years straight in various editions from Ace, and that's the Sword of Rianne. Uh, you can get it in paperback, different covers. Um, it was reprinted in a British trade paperback uh, called Sea Kings of Mars. You can find that. It's not that expensive. And the original pulp 
uh, for Sea Kings of Mars was Thrilling Wonder Stories, June 49, which there should be copies in the room. And to answer the other question, my favorite bracket story uh, is also from Thrilling Wonder Stories. And that is called The Veil of a Stellar from Thrilling Wonder Stories, Spring 44. It's a short story. Um, it's bracketed at the peak of her powers. Everything's established. She's got her own voice. And in a short version, it is everything about her writing that I think makes her a powerful storyteller. And the ending, you will never forget it. And just to tease you all, just today I saw a copy of that issue in the dealer's room, and it's still there. <laughs> so to my you, sell you it. can all go crazy trying to find it. I'd sell it to you, but the book I printed it in is out of print. So with that, let's please give a round of applause to our panelists. Thank you all very much for coming, and we'll start the next presentation in just a few minutes.